There's a passage in one of his books where John Lee blurs the distinctions between virtue, concentration, discernment. Concentration, he says, is a developed aspect of virtue. As you're sitting here, you're not only observing the five precepts outside, but as you get the mind into concentration, you're observing them inside. You're not killing your good qualities. You're not stealing the bad qualities of other people to think about. You're not engaging in illicit thoughts about sex. You're not lying to yourself, and you're not intoxicated. You're alert. You're mindful. And as you develop your discernment, you bring the mind to deeper and deeper levels of peace. So discernment is a, an advanced version of concentration. This is a theme that you see throughout the forest tradition. John Cha makes a comparison. He says the practice is like a mango. The mango has one end where the stem is and another end on the other side, but it's all one mango. Virtue is the stem side. Discernment is the other side, but it's all one mango. So the question is, what is the advantage of thinking in these ways? Well, one is that it reminds you that as you work on any of the three, you're strengthening the two others. This is why when John Swat was asked how to bring meditation into daily life, he said, work on your precepts. One of the people there who was listening and was very upset, thinking that John Swat was basically implying that lay people we're not up to doing real meditation in the daily life. But his point was actually something else entirely. Remember the word for meditation, bhavana, means to develop. And as you're developing good qualities through observing the precepts, these qualities are then going to have an impact on your concentration and an impact on your discernment. Because remember what discernment is that lies as a thread through all three of these practices. What, when I do it, will lead to my long-term welfare and happiness? What, when I do it, would lead to my long-term harm and pain? So by observing the precepts, you're working for your long-term welfare and happiness. And you're developing that inner voice, the observer, the commentator. And you're learning how to train it. So much has been written about how horrible it is that we have this inner critic. We have to silence the inner critic and learn how to speak to ourselves only in positive terms. But the issue is a lot more subtle than that. The inner critic has to know what are the values that you want to talk about. What are the things that you should be observing? And you should be observing when are you doing harm? How can you stop doing harm? And how many levels of harm are there? There are many levels. There's a harm you can do with your speech. Harm to yourself, harm to others. Harm you can do with your actions. Then as you get into concentration, harm is not quite the word, then it turns into a disturbance. How do you disturb yourself when you're meditating? You start out with direct thought and evaluation, but there comes a point where you don't need those aspects anymore and you have to drop them, and you get into a state of concentration that's less disturbed. Then the disturbance is the rapture. You drop that, go to the pleasure. And then you get to a point where even pleasure seems to be a disturbance, the mind wants to be really still. The fact that you have to breathe seems to be a disturbance. You want to be still. And from there you can go into the formless states. Having to maintain a perception of the shape of the body is a disturbance. And 
and so on through the various levels of concentration. And then, of course, with your discernment. You see how the mind creates unnecessary suffering for itself, sometimes in the concentration, sometimes as you're leaving concentration, sometimes as you're going through the day. And you learn to drop that. Whatever's causing it, you drop it. So it's all one process. Simply, it differs in levels of subtlety. And what you find that you're doing is you're focusing more and more attention on this commentator inside. What are its values? And how harmless is the commentator? The commentator will learn how to focus on other parts of the mind as you're going through the day, as you're sitting and meditating. But also has to learn how to focus on itself. It has to train itself. For instance, I may be focusing on the fact that your emphasis on pressure on the breath is too strong. But how does it tell you that it's too strong? Does it tell you in a way that's self-defeating or in a way that's encouraging? Here's a mistake you're making, but you can undo the mistake and you can get more and more skilled. So in all three cases, virtue, concentration, and discernment, we're training this inner commentator, bring it more and more to the fore. After all, with virtue, it is an issue primarily of your intentions. What is your intention in acting? What is your intention in speaking? And John Munn made a big point about this. The textbooks in Thailand that were produced in the 1910s defined virtue simply as restraint of body and speech. There's no mention of intention at all. And John Munn pointed out that it was taking a ceremonial view of the precepts, a purely external view of the precepts, where the true essence of the precepts, the true essence of virtue, was the intention. And then that goes into your concentration. You intend to stay with one thing. It goes into your discernment. You intend to solve this problem of why the mind keeps creating unnecessary suffering. And so you reflect. It falls back to that old passage where the Buddha says the two ways you learn the Dharma are through commitment and through reflection. You commit yourself to the triple training, and then you reflect on how you're doing it. And then you reflect on the commentator. One, to see how skillful it is, so that it's not discouraging, so it's not this horrible beast of a critic, that its criticism is there not so much to put a final stamp of disapproval on something. But simply to say, this is a work in progress. This is how things can be done better. Let's do them better. And so all three are similar, all three are connected in that they're training that inner commentator. And you get more and more interested in who is this commentator? Who's talking to whom in here? Why does the mind need to be sending messages like this? That's when it gets really interesting. It's when you get this inner commentator on friendly terms with everybody else in the mind that you can really look into it. Not trying to push it away, not trying to deny it, but just simply seeing what's going on. Why does this have to go on? What happens if we stop? And John Lee again, in his description of the different jhanas, he makes the point that when you leave 
the first jhana and go into the second. Drop your directed thought and evaluation. That's one spot when the noble path and the noble fruit can arise, appear. Those are the three aspects of yourself, the self as the producer, the self as the consumer, the self as the commentator. Focusing in on the commentator, you see an awful lot. And when you can let go of it, there's a lot of freedom. But you can't let go until it's been trained. And who's going to do the training? It has to train itself. This is why we say you don't drop your sense of self right at the beginning. You learn how to train your sense of self until it's no longer needed. That's when you put it down. So it's through training all aspects of the mind, through virtue, concentration, and discernment, that this inner commentator gets trained as well. And when it's well trained, you can see it for what it is. And let go on friendly terms. <laughs>